How men treat the truth of God's word. Uh, if you've got lesson one, that's where we're going to start. Um, and I want you to go to Acts chapter 20. And we'll start there. Acts chapter 20. And verse, let's start in... Uh, We'll start in verse 22, uh, Acts 20, 22. And Paul says, uh, he says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save, he says, that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, he says. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. That's a good attitude. He says, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Mark that verse, verse 24, because it is the perfect example of the perfect preacher doing the, preaching the perfect message. Okay, and he doesn't want to stop, and he's been sick several times. He almost died once. He's been beat up. He's been rocked. He's been thrown out in in the deep. And uh, when they talk about the deep, they're talking about the ocean. When the ships crash and or they sink or whatever, he's floating around out there. You just get a little sprinkle of that. Okay, he's not going to focus on it. But then he goes on. He says. This whole idea, he says, so that I might finish my course with joy. He has a course. Just like a, a person who would work in the Old Testament program, they had their course. Remember, they used to go from their home, and they would, he would do a course for like six months, and then he could go back home for six months and take care of his farm and his family and so forth. So when the priest operated like that, they did a lot of this kind of stuff and so what he says, and this is kind of a farewell to the saints in Asia, and he says in verse 27, if you look at it, he says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He has been blameless in delivering his message. He's been doing what he was given to do. And so what I'm going to talk to you about in the next few weeks as we go through this, these two worksheets the idea is is to, to take a look at how men treat the Word of God. Okay? When they, how men treat the truth of God's Word. How do they do it? And one of the things we were just talking about a while ago was the Bibles that are being used in, in, in all the, the confusion about the Bible and how people buy a Bible, how people use a Bible, and then how they get mixed up from the Bible that they buy when they're when they're missing thousands of verses. And so they don't understand it. They don't quite get it. But Paul declares the truth. And he talks to them about the risen Lord Jesus Christ and, and so forth. So I want you to go over to Acts 18. Turn back to Acts 18 and look at verse 24. Acts 18, 24. This is where a young man came to know the grace message, okay? His name is Apollos, and he's at Ephesus, and look at verse 24, 18, 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. That's as far as he got. In his teaching and preaching, he was dynamic, no doubt about it. In verse 26, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him, notice, the way of God more perfectly. What is the word of God more perfectly? It's the grace message. The kingdom is postponed, and the grace message is now in full flight. It's, it's on its way. 
to being something that would last two millennia. That's how long we've been dealing with this new dispensation. So the way of God more perfectly is something that he needed to learn, wasn't it? He was he was spoken to and he was taught the way of God more perfectly. Look at verse 27. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much, which had believed through grace. So when he met grace believers, he continued on because why? Priscilla and Aquila bought him up to date. He brought him up to that point where he was established in the faith of the message of Paul. And so when he got there, he's getting there and, and he's helping those and, and those that were had believed through the grace of God, but they didn't have they didn't have the advanced material. And he did. He was a very smart man, evidently. He says, for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly. He did it in public, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Wow, that's a lot in four or five verses there of what this man did. And Apollos went on to be one of Paul's greatest helpers. And so you, you see, some people are able to look at it and say, oh, that's interesting. Or they'll look at it and say, I never knew that. Or uh, they'll look at this and or you give them this and you say, well, what page am I on here? What are we doing? <laughs> so he wasn't that way. He knew exactly what he was doing because he just had been taught by a man and his wife. And you know what they did with Paul? Anybody know? What did Aquila and Priscilla do? What was their main job? Tent makers. Tent makers. They were true tent makers. And that's how Paul got together with them. He was also able to make tents. Somewhere along the line, he learned how to make tents. And so they probably teached him and, and helped him do that too. But what did he need? He needed money. He needed funds. He was no longer getting money from anywhere else. So he had to get these things so that he could help not only get to place, get himself to, from place to place as he travels, but he's also getting all these other people that couldn't continue to go along with him because they didn't have the funds. So he was he was really had a kind of a real interesting uh, beginning. And, uh, and, and when you see all the time he spent away from everybody and then they finally found him, uh, Barnabas went out and he found Paul and they said, where have you been, you know? And he says, well, <laughs> it's a long story. But it was a, quite a few years before he ever ganged up with, uh, go back to Acts 13 and you'll see it. The first missionary activity that you see is in Acts chapter 13 and Paul and Barnabas uh, are called by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So you see this in Acts 13. This is the big... We've talked about this Acts 13, Acts uh, uh, 15, Acts 9, verse 13... Uh, or, excuse me, Acts 9, Acts 13, and Acts 20, uh, 26. So you see these different changes that move through the book of Acts. And when you get to Acts 13... It's starting to become Paul's book now. Luke is writing it specifically uh, about what Paul is doing. So the whole, the whole portion of the book of Acts is really about what we have here. So the transition book is making its way, and it starts in the first 13 chapters, the first 12 chapters. It's, it's just some other things going on with this program over here. And then when Saul gets saved in 9... Boom, it shoots forward and it begins to open things up. It's a transition book because it's going to transition you from what? From the beginning of the learning of what Paul was doing until the finishing of it, see? And this is a really fascinating book. And uh, if you look at chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So evidently Herod the Tetrarch and Saul knew each other and they were been, they had been brought up with these different people and this is kind of a group that they knew and then look at verse 2 and they ministered to the Lord and fasted 
And notice this. This is a very, very interesting phrase in the Bible, and it's not used a lot. In verse 2, And they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Spirit said. Now, what kind of body do you think he was in when he said it? (laughs) A spiritual body, right. You know, that's it. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And this is really the beginning of Paul's first true missionary journey. He had been out on his own, but he was he was spent a lot of time in in uh, Arabia. And uh, who else spent a lot of time in Arabia? Remember the burning bush? Yeah, Moses was there. And, and so he went into Arabia, and God has this mountain over there, <laughs> and it's all blackened up because of what happened during the, <laughs> when they came out of Egypt 1,500 years before this. But, but God has places to commune with other people, and it's very, it's very conducive to being able to talk to people. When Moses was there, he, he said some pretty rough things to Moses. But when Paul goes there, He's going there to get taught. He's going there to get some teaching. He's going there because he's going to spend some time personally with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not just the calling out to him from the air and he's fallen off of his horse the day he gets saved in Acts 9. He's going there to get more advanced truth and more information so that he can come out of there and go back to Antioch and go back to these other places and find out exactly what's going on since he's been kind of away, okay? And they couldn't find him. They kept looking for him. And they sent Barnabas to find him, and he did. And so Barnabas brings all this new information, and he what he does is he, he tells all these people that were so skeptical about who Saul was, and he says, no, he's, he's saved. He got saved. And it said, then all the churches... Had rest. They were. They had. They had all. These are people that had. He had run them out of Jerusalem, and killed a bunch of them. Okay, and, and you know that the, those people probably had families in various places, and in, especially in Jerusalem. But the whole thing just blew up. And when that thing blew up, meaning the the little flock, at the end of it, there was twenty thousand people less. Okay, that's a lot of carnage. That's a lot of, that's a really, now you understand why they'll pull their their stakes up and go and run is what they were doing. And uh, Saul was running after him. As a matter of fact, he drove them all out of Jerusalem and that's why he went to Antioch. And so when he was on his way there, uh, it became evident that, hey, something's got to give. And in Acts chapter 9, the Lord Jesus Christ knocked him off his horse along with all of his other buddies. And they could hear what was going on and they could hear language and they could hear speech, but they couldn't discern it. Because the Lord was talking directly to him. And when he said, Who art thou? Now, if you knew it was God, you would never really say, Who art thou? <laughs> Who else could it be, (laughs) you know? So he goes and he says, Who art thou? And then he says the word, Lord. Like, Lord, is, is that you? He didn't know. And it's fascinating to see how simplistic this kind of looks when you look at it on paper like this, but it's really the, the beginning of his life as a believer. He got saved right then and there. And so it pays for somebody to get this way of God more perfectly figured out. And at that time, he he didn't have any of it figured out. But by Acts 18, he's got a couple working with him, and they've got a beautiful place in Rome, and they have a church in Rome. In Rome, there were about six or ten so churches that were in homes. 
But in their homes, they had huge, giant uh, areas, like when you walk into a, a, a building and you've got the structure and then you've got a big wall around it with an open courtyard and all that. They had plenty of room. They had servants. They had all kinds of things. And Priscilla and Aquila, uh, they, they were real they were real friends with Paul. They had gotten together with him, and man, they really helped him. And I, I'm thinking they probably are the ones who made him or helped him with the tent making and taught him that. He might have known some before. I can't imagine Saul of Tarsus being a tent maker when he was a rich, young dude, you know. But the fact is, he had a lot of enemies. Uh, go to Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, this is the second verse. Acts 17 and verse 30. Acts 17 and verse 30. And Paul is hanging around on Mars Hill. And he's looking at what's going on in Mars Hill. And if you look back in verse 22, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that ye in all things are too superstitious. So as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription. And what is the inscription there? To the unknown God. How can you have an unknown God? How could he be your God if he was unknown? They just didn't know what to put on the thing, and they said, well, this is the, this is the last one we built, so we've got to put something on it. Right? <laughs> to the unknown God. Well, Paul capitalizes on that phrase and he says, Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship? The unknown God. It's ridiculous. He says, Him declare I unto you. He's unknown to you, so I'm going to tell you about who my Savior is. He says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So you see where the nations went. And you see when when they were cast out over that whole area in in Africa and and India and and what we call China today, all of that was populated when all of this stuff happened from the Tower of Babel. Okay, and basically what you see here is the forming of the nations. In verse twenty six, uh, he says, "And hath made of one blood," he says, "all nations." Now, how can you be racist if you've got one blood and all these nations? I mean, the whole thing stemmed from two people. And they, and they were people that didn't obey God. <laughs> but finally, when it got to the point where God's going to make these nations, which, which is a very important part of his plan. And his plan was to populate the earth, obviously. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said. Now here's a quote of a heathen poet in the King James Bible. Notice he says, For we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, which is what they had just made a uh, kind of a small place to worship. Uh, and they didn't know what to put on it. So they said, it's the unknown God. Well, it's stone or graven by art and man's device. Now notice verse 30. He says, and the times of this ignorance, God, what? 
What happened from the time all these things happened from Adam and Eve all the way up until this time? This is 4,000 years of human history. Paul's in play. The Lord Jesus Christ has been crucified. Now the Lord Jesus Christ has contacted Paul and he's, he's getting him to go to work. If you see that what if you see that in verse 30, he says, God winked at, and then notice what it says after that. But now. It was this way, but now it's going to be this way. And he says, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. What does he mean by that? What do you think repentance means? Change your mind. Change your mind, right. And why would you change your mind? Well, it's because you've got something that you want to get rid of and get something better. You have free will volition, as I spoke about a while ago. And when you have that understanding that I can make a decision and change my mind and change my life, you realize that that's true. We can do that. He says, He commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because He hath appointed a day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained. And He says, Whereof He hath given assurance unto all men in that He hath raised Him from the dead, the proof of the resurrection. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. He just walked away, and he said, How be it? Uh, you see how Luke is writing this thing. He says, How be it certain men clave unto him and believed him, among which was Dionysius the Oropagite and a woman named Dem Damaris and others with them. You see, they didn't get the whole crowd, but they walked away with some certain people. And he's picking these people up along as, as he goes. All men everywhere. And it's, it's funny to see it because there's certain ways that people treat the Bible. And I guess you might say that if you want to talk about it this way, there's, there's always something inside of a human being, no matter where they live on this planet, that they want to know about the Lord. They want to know about God. They want to know about the creation. And uh, a lot of those people are so balled up and, and kind of bound up in a situation where they just can't do anything but scratch and, and fight and, 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 and get in trouble and, and cause problems and everything. If they could get saved, what would happen? You see, the all men everywhere is what Paul's mission was. All men. Everywhere. Anywhere and everywhere. So when you walk up to somebody, you don't have racist thinking. You don't have anger. You don't have a, 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 a time to talk about silliness when you're talking about this book. So as you go through it, you, you just remember this. Look over to Acts 26. That's number three. I didn't mark the. I didn't put the numbers down, but you can count with me. Uh, Acts 26. And Paul makes a claim in Acts 26 and 17 to 19. And you'll see it. Go to Acts 26. And we'll start in verse. Let's start in. Um, let's start down in 14. Um, or I'm sorry, 13. He says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven. He's given his testimony. This is the last time he gives it. And this is by far the best one. He says, At midday, O king, I saw the way a light. I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. Now that's pretty incredible. Just to even say that. He says, Shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when they were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speak unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul. What does Jesus Christ speak? Hebrew. Okay? And that's because he's speaking to a Hebrew. But can he speak in all the other languages? Absolutely. Okay? So he says here, he says, Saul, Saul. Verse 14. 
Why persecutest thou me? Now that's a pretty tall order, isn't it? To ask the man that's that's there that he's been he's been causing so much problems, so many problems, and 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 everybody's trying to get him. So all of his friends are against him now, and then the natural enemies that he had, all of a sudden, he's running. He's doing things and, and trying to get away from things because he's in danger. The perils of Paul are beautifully listed in Paul's epistles of all the things that he had to go through, a day and a night in the deep. I mean, how, do you, how who wants to float around in the dark in the day and the night of the deep? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's weird, but he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He says, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, the prick here is a long pole with a point on the end, and you, they had that through some eyelets, and they, they just sat that thing in there, and when that, when that ox stopped and didn't want to go anymore, they just pricked him right in the, in the butt, right there in the top part of his butt, and he'd hit him, and the thing would go and start walking again. And he says, you're doing the same thing, buddy. You're kicking against all that. You're kicking back at me. You're, you're, you're trying to do something against me. It's hard for thee to keep on living like this and kicking against the pricks. He says, and I said, who art thou, Lord? Question mark there. He says, and he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Those are the last words I'd ever want to hear. Because when you start talking to God like that, and then God talks back to you, and he, he, he's, he's trying to reason with him. And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now, who could, who could persecute God? Well, evidently, he did it because he killed a lot of people. And who were these people? They were members of the little flock of Peter, James, and John. And they had grown and swelled up into this giant group. And, and they had almost taken over Jerusalem. And he ran every single one of them off, and he had to go to Damascus to find more of them, and that's what he did. He said, there's no more here. We got them all. They're all pinned up. They're all in jail. They're all whatever, are, you know, those, those that are dead and so forth. Verse 16, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. He says in verse 19 that he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Go down to verse 19. He says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, uh, he's talking to him, he says, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly heavenly vision he's standing there he's he's giving an account of his testimony about his conversion it's three times in the book of acts you can't get past acts 13 acts 18 and acts 26 without seeing and reading about this the lord jesus christ has a mission for him okay and he says in verse 17, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You see... The whole idea of getting Satan out of people comes from you putting Jesus Christ into people. So when you put the Lord Jesus Christ, when you give the gospel and they believe your message, they get saved. Boom. And when they get saved, the power of Satan is no longer in them. He cannot live in and cohabitate with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? So he says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light 
and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, he says. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. In other words, prove your repentance. Okay? Go to Acts chapter 26 and verse 25. Let's go down the page there a little bit. And I want you to start with me in verse 22. He says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. And he has a mission. And he clearly takes hold of it. But he's telling this to this other king, Agrippa. And so when you see it, you look at it and he says, For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple, in verse 21, and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. In this particular time in his life, he was at an impasse. He was going to Rome. Why was he going to Rome? Well, what happened is he had to appeal. And to appeal, you have to go to the court. And the court was in Rome. And so he goes to Caesarea, and he spends two years there, and he gets a bunch of people saved, and then he just keeps on going. And he's on his way, okay? Now, he says in verse 22, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great. Notice, saying none other things than those which the prophets and, the, and Moses did say should come. You see, the Bible that we read today was not in play at that time. And Paul wrote a lot of his letters later in life. So those things that happened later were the, were the books that he would send out and they would be copied and so forth. So he's not, he's not really addressing in this particular passage anything of having to do about the mystery or any of that. He's just talking about doing what he was told to do by the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells Agrippa that and his wife. And so he says that Christ, verse 23, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spoke for himself, Festus, with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. <laughs> you are crazy boy he says but he said I am not mad most noble Festus but speak forth the words of truth and soberness for the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him for this thing was not done in a corner king Agrippa believest thou the prophets I know that thou believest then Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. <laughs> and Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also that uh, all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except for the bonds he's got on him. He's changed. This is his last recorded incident in as such and you get down to the rest of it you know the storm and all that stuff it, but this is the this is the place where he gets stopped and of course I want to tell you that these places where he got stopped this is represented here all three of these 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 interventions are all one event it's just three different viewpoints Okay. 
But for some reason, God felt that it was important that we really start to understand what's happening from Acts 9 all the way to Acts 28. Okay? He was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And he speaks forth the word, the words of truth. Go back to Romans chapter 9. There is a lot of different ways that people mess with God's word. How do they treat it? Well, they need to treat it, first of all, by finding the correct version, which is the King James Bible, the authorized version. And also, they need to know how to figure out how to use the books. Most people do not understand the Pauline epistles and why they're there. And that's really important. And that's why the book of Acts transitions you in from from the old program over here that's done. And when, when was this program over? When, when, the, when you see the ministry of Jesus and the 12, the, the 12 apostles, where does this end? It, it goes from right here is the end of the cross. But, but as he spends the 40 days with him, this little bump right here, after that, he leaves. So he spends 40 days teaching them all that they needed to know. And then, what's the arrow going down there? That's the Holy Spirit descending on them on the day of Pentecost. And there's the stoning of Stephen right there. That's a year right here from Acts 2 to 7. And then that's pretty much it. Corporately, the nation of Israel falls. So they lost their political power way back here when they were in Babylon, and now they've lost their religious power or their spiritual power because now you guys are you're you're just you're gone, you're done. And the thing changes, and you know, Christendom today hasn't made this change. I, I, I you know I keep saying it over and over, and the chart's really more powerful when it's shut because the fact is that you're not on it. So when you're not on it, what do you do? Well, that's what the folks in denominational Christianity are doing today is they're trying to figure this thing out and they just haven't opened up the chart. Replace the that's right. They want to they wanna replace these things with something somewhere else and what happens is they don't have it. it it's really weird. You know, they, they just can't conceive. And, and you would think that as you move in a book from left to right, like we all do when we read a book, we don't read them backwards. We read them left to right. Okay? When you see that here in the but now time period, it's all explained in Ephesians. This whole thing begins to make sense. And the, the books that we have, Romans through Philemon, are the books that Christianity actually is made up of. There is no Christianity in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Not one bit. And there's none of it from Hebrews to Revelation either. <laughs> so what do you do with this? Well, you study about the apostle who's going to give you the message. Okay? He says, I speak the truth in Christ. Go to Romans 9. And he says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. And he, he goes through this. I speak the truth in Christ. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He's a true soul winner. He had he had an, a, a, a genuine love for his nation. And he says in verse 4, Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers and of whom as Christ uh, concerning the flesh Christ came? 
who is over all. God bless forever. Amen. Paul's ready to give his life. He's really ready to give it up. If the nation would be able to get back together, what he probably did figure out, I'm sure he figured out his own book of Romans, but a lot of times, I mean, the prophets that wrote things had to read it to figure it out. They didn't, they weren't, they weren't thinking it up. They were giving it, they were, they were giving it directly from God and it goes from God to man to the paper. And so when he's talking here, he's talking about this, these privileges, these sevenfold privileges of Israel. He's, he's talking about this great sorrow, he says in verse 2, this continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He never gave up on his own folks. I speak the truth in Christ. You know, chapters 9, 10, and 11 is really an interruption of the book of Romans. It's an interruption. It's a, it's a gap. So it's almost like you see this whole thing, and here's the gap right here, or the but now period. Well, in the book of Romans, the reason that he stops and goes through 9, 10, and 11 talking about this situation with Israel, and he's getting this Israel's past and, and Israel's present and Israel's future, you realize, and you go through your Bible, you see past, present, future is very important. Past, present, future. It's, it's always past, present, future. And you're always losing the present to the past. Okay? So the past is past. Now the present is here, and it's it's going away. Tomorrow, today's going to be past. Okay, and so it just keeps on going. It just keeps on going. And so now, you have an understanding now, and you read Romans nine with this in mind. It's parenthetical, and so you see that chapter nine shows Israel's failure in the past and why they came to all of this and lost the country. They lost their kingdom. They lost their their entire way of life. Judaism was not something that, that they they could hold on to. And people try to do it today, but they don't. They can't. They don't have... What's sitting on top of the, the Dome of the Rock? The Dome of the Rock. <laughs> it's there, right? And you go in there, and I have a picture in... in Biblical archaeology magazines I have, these things are great. They, they take these photographs over there. When you walk in that thing, it's it's just a big, giant, circular fence, metal fence like this, bars. And the top of that mountain is exposed right there. And you know what's you know what's there? In the center of that that circular, there it is right there. There's a square there right there. And it's it's sunk down into the ground because that's where the Holy of Holies was, and that's where they put the Ark of the Covenant. The dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant are already carved in the top of that mountain. That mountain has a, a, a cropped, cleared top. No trees, anything like that. And when you see that beautiful gold dome in, in Israel, when you go see those things, you see that the top of that mountain is where Abraham took his son to kill him. This is real close information to those folks. And who's got it now? Yeah the enemies of God. And those enemies, they got that thing and they're holding it. And uh, they show they show a lot of things. You know, when you look at it, you say, wow, that's fantastic. But they lost it. Chapter 9 shows how 
unwillingly they were to receive their Savior, and they fell. So they lost the political power when they got, all got torn away and taken down into Babylon. And then some of them came back, but most of them didn't. And then you, you, you see here, when this happened with the 12 apostles and so forth, what you see is you see that thing go over the cliff too. The fall and then the diminishing away. For 2,000 years, what have they been doing? They've been diminishing away. They're scattered everywhere. And they have no real political power, and they very little. Only, only in Israel today do they have some little kind of snippet of power. But their past was a sordid past. And so now in chapter 10, you see them today. So you get to see what they're doing today, and it's all about them and their opportunity to get the gospel. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought the gospel was to go to the Gentiles. But when you go to the Gentiles, what do you find? That, that God has declared through Paul that there's no difference between a Jew and a Gentile. Now, they don't like to hear that. Oh, man, they don't like to hear that. The Gentiles are fine, but it's the Jews that don't want to be lumped in with the Gentiles. They, they just know that that's a different thing. That's why this wall is actually up. It goes down, and now, then it goes up again. You see, chapter 10 is, is our present day. It's functioning for Jews to function in this period we call but now. I told you about uh, a guy across the street from us, and he used to come over and bug my dad a lot. <laughs> and uh, we he used to have these cigars, you know, and he'd come in and he'd talk and smoke and listen. And, you know, it was just very strange. And my dad would talk to him all the time about the Lord and everything. And he just, he just, you know, just, no, I don't know. I don't know. You know he, he's a, he, he had a haberdashery. He was a clothes guy. And, uh, and he'd walk around with a cigar and he was and, 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 and he's talking to me. I'm living in the dispensation of grace, and my dad and I are talking to him. And I got to talk to him quite a bit too. And uh, it has to do with them being getting saved. Chapter ten is a, is that preaching of the gospel of peace. It's the it's the idea that if you look at verse twelve in chapter ten, he says, "For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek." <laughs> for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So you see that that chapter 10, it's a little different. It's, it's one of those things where it's in the center and, and we only have 21 verses here from 10.1 to 10.21. That's the current position of what Israel is now doing. In, in whatever form they're doing it, okay? Chapter 11 is when they get saved. It looks pretty dark. And when you start reading chapter 10, okay? But, but when you get to chapter 11, there's the question. Look at chapter 11 and verse 1. He says, I say then, Hath God cast away his people? Now, you read chapter 10, you'll see why he says it that way. But he says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, he says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, as he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets? And dig down thine altars. That was the big one right there. The kingdom that Israel had before it was torn down by Nebuchadnezzar was on the top of Mount Moriah. And when Jesus Christ hung on that cross and that veil that was this thick sown that thick. That thing is huge. And it's like a shoebox kind of standing up like that, the building is. And that curtain's there. And it opens it up. 
And that's what you saw. Now today they went out and built a building around it and put a dome on it, okay? But but then back then when Christ hung on that cross, that veil rent in two by itself. And what did it expose? It exposed the Holy of Holies, their Holy of Holies, which didn't mean a thing. <laughs> you know why? Because there was nobody there. The person that was in charge of the Holy of Holies was out hanging on the cross like this. There is, there is a way for Israel. And that has not been taken away from them. In the dispensation of the grace of God, the kingdom of heaven is postponed and now the mystery has been revealed and the grace of God is now ready to go out to what? All people. If you walk up to somebody and give them the gospel and you think they're a Gentile, they might be a Jew. You never know. They might not even know anything about Judaism in their family tree either. But in chapter 11, we see Israel's future is secure. He says in verse 11, look at 11, 11. We'll stop with this. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Well, they were kind of put under this, this, I guess you might say they were thrown into the pot with everybody else. They no longer had any spiritual power. They no longer had any political power. Look at how, like I said, about Menachem Begin and all these people over there in, in the Holy Land, they, they, they don't have any real power. They just they have nuclear weapons is all they got. <laughs> and, uh, and so since none of the Arab states have it, they, they kind of stay away from that. And uh, it's there. It's available. You, go, you can go see the whole thing. And it's all divided up into different sections in Jerusalem and all that. And it's kind of it's kind of sad. If you look at verse seven, go up to verse seven. He says, "What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded." You go on down to verse twelve. He says, "Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more?" their fullness. Israel's going to come back. Israel's going to be saved. He says, For I speak to you Gentiles, in verse 13, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Listen to me. I've got the office. He says, If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. I mean, he's trying to help save the Jews. He wants to get them saved too. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Go down to verse 25. He says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, that, he says, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened. It's happening in ten Okay. He's today, right now. They're blind. They don't see it. He says that blindness in part now. It doesn't mean a Jew can't get saved. It just means that it's going to be a little bit more difficult because they're bound up in their own religion and they don't know how to get out of it. And a Gentile is not going to tell them how to do that because they don't know how to do it either. He says is happened to Israel. Blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And notice verse 26. Uh, 11.26 And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sin. Do you realize that the entire nation of Israel for 1,500 years, their, their problem was they believed the wrong message? We're going to talk about that later and, and more extensively on that. That's a really important issue. 
they have a problem, and and they're still losing in that problem. But when you meet a Jewish person today who has been converted to Christianity, he's few and far between. Very few and far between. All right. We'll stop here, and uh, we'll we'll take up next week, and we've got some more verses here for you. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and we thank you for the blessings that we have in Christ. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.